All right, everybody. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, we have a whole series of attendees that are just logging in, so we'll give uh, people a few more seconds to be up and ready for that. Um, welcome to our IMF Patient and Family webinar uh, that we've entitled today, uh, New Treatments, Diversity, and Caregiver Support. Uh, my name is Joe McHale. I have the privilege of being the Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation. Uh, and I'm a professor at the Translational Genomics Research Institute here in Phoenix, Arizona, which is part of the City of Hope Cancer Center. And it's absolutely my pleasure to be able to chair this outstanding group of individuals um, who I will just briefly mention. Um, we have, of course, our president, uh, Susie Dury. And I need to say that um, although you've probably been to several patient meetings before and patient and family seminars before, uh, those of you who are listening today, um, I need to say that Susie has really been a pioneer in this. Susie came up with this idea of educating patients directly about their disease in conjunction with their families at a time when that was not normal for the medical community. At the time, it was the classic physician saying, you know, here, take this pill, trust me, I'm your doctor, you don't need to know <laughs> this. And uh, Susie has been an incredible innovator uh, in developing the IMF as the founder of the IMF, as one of the co-founders of the IMF, but specifically in this patient family seminar. So we're so glad, Susie, that you could join us today. Uh, it's a little early for us on the West Coast, so I appreciate you getting up so early and looking so fantastic. Uh, so we're just delighted to have you here. Uh, and Susie and Robin Tui, who's the vice president of our support groups, will be joining us um, for the fourth and final section of our session today to share with us some really important information regarding uh, caregiver support uh, and perhaps no more important than now in the midst of the crazy world that we live in. So Robin and Susie, we're thankful to have you here. Uh, furthermore, I'm delighted to have uh, three um, outstanding clinicians and also friends. Don't hold it against them that they're my friends, but they are very good friends of mine, and I love all three of them. Um, and so Beth Feynman has joined us. She is a, a nurse practitioner at uh, the in, in Cleveland, of course, because we were initially going to have this meeting physically in Cleveland. And I, I guarantee you today that this will be a much less contentious discussion than an other unmentionable discussion in Cleveland this week. Um, so Beth, thank you for joining us. Uh, also with us is Dr. Deepu Maduri, um, who is uh, joining us from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, who is an extraordinary myeloma investigator. She has been on the cutting edge of many of the new immune therapies that we're gonna be discussing today, which includes CAR T cell therapies, which is obviously a very exciting realm. And then last, but absolutely not least, a very good friend for many years, Dr. Craig Cole, who comes to us from Michigan State University, um, who has donned the bow tie today to join us. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Craig, Craig is uh, another outstanding myeloma investigator who has advocated for outstanding research in myeloma, but has been a particular um, uh, expert in the field of diversity in multiple myeloma, uh, and reaching out to the African-American community in particular, which we will be discussing in our third segment today. So with all of those introductions uh, done, let me uh, get us started on the curriculum that we're going to be uh, covering today. We have a pretty aggressive agenda for the next two hours, uh, but we trust it will be helpful to you. We do recommend that if you have questions that you can uh, reach out to us with them. Um, there is opportunity in the question box to submit questions. We've prepared many questions, some for you, uh, you listeners. Uh, so make sure that you have the opportunity to, die, to, to um, answer those as we go. Uh, but we hope this will be very helpful to you uh, to understand this disease better. Uh, I particularly want to take a moment to thank the sponsors that we have. As you can see here, we have a whole series of them, including uh, Amgen, uh, Binding Site, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, uh, GSK, Janssen, Caria Farm, Oncopeptides, Sanofi Genzyme, and Takeda Oncology. So we're particularly grateful for their support in being able to do this. Uh, and it is actually such an exciting time in myeloma to see so many different companies involved 
with a lot of these new drugs, many of which we are going to be discussing in great length uh, today. So for our first part, as I mentioned, for the first three sections, we're going to be um, uh, using our uh, group of four here, the, the uh, the fabulous four, if I'm allowed to call us that for a few minutes, uh, as we come to discuss many of these things. So uh, we're going to focus initially on um, the uh, new developments in multiple myeloma, uh, which is the first of the four sections, and that's actually going to be uh, the longest of our four sections today. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time uh, on uh, new developments in myeloma. Then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about COVID-19. I know in some ways you kind of wish we would never have to talk about it again, but we're going to talk a little bit about it and relevance to the myeloma community. Uh, and then we're going to have a short uh, stretch break to make sure that we don't uh, uh, get too stiff. Uh, and then for our second section, we'll talk about diversity in myeloma and caregiver support. So let's dive right into new developments. If I were really only allowed to show one slide today, this is a slide I created to just try and get that high level view of all the amazing things that are happening in myeloma right now. I mean, it's really remarkable to us to see the kinds of things that are happening. So we have in this last year approved three brand new drugs. So Expovia or Selenexor was approved last July. We have Isatuximab known as Sarclisa, which is used in combination with pomalidomide, was uh, approved in the spring of this year. And then just recently in the last month or so, a Belantamab Mapidotin, uh, also known as Blenrep, has just joined us. And we'll talk about what these drugs are throughout the, the session today, but I wanted you to see we have three brand new ones. But we also have new sort of indications, if you will. So these are drugs that we've already used, but now we can use them in a different context. Daratumumab can be given now subcutaneously. I wasn't sure in my mind if that's truly a new drug, but it's really, it is a new formulation of the drug for sure. But now instead of a lengthy infusion, it can be given in five minutes subcutaneously. We'll talk a bit about that as we go. And then most recently, the combination of carfilzomib and daratumab together because of a study that we'll talk about, the Candor study was just approved. So we have all this that has just happened. And then we have the next bucket of things that we know are, are likely to be approved in the very near future combining isatuximab and carfilzomib, we'll talk about that. A completely new agent, melphalan flufenamide, the artist formerly known as melflufen. We could see a new, indi new indication of selenex or being used with bortezomib. And then we'll definitely get a chance to talk about CAR T-cell therapy, specifically Idacel, um, with Deepu and the rest of us shortly. And then looking maybe just a little bit beyond that horizon, we could see daratumumab joining the frontline therapy, classically of VRD or KRD. We will see um, uh, the Janssen Legend product, which I'm going to take complete responsibility for. When I was typing this out, I misspelled it. Sorry, uh, Siltacel is with a C, not an S, so uh, my bad. But there's a lot of excitement about this drug, and we'll talk about it. Um, there's another new class of drugs called the cell mods, and I'll explain briefly what those are. Um, and then looking a little bit further ahead, but nonetheless very important, and we'll discuss them, will be what are called the bispecifics or tri-specific drugs that we'll talk about, uh, other CAR T-cell therapies, and then a whole series of other combinations. Uh, and then there are other drugs that we know we use in different diseases, but we may be able to use them soon for myeloma, such as venetoclax. So then trying to still give you this balcony view before we talk about the data, this is kind of where we are now, where most of us are using a VRD or DRD-like combination, plus or minus transplant, going on to maintenance therapy, classically being given uh, a daratumumab-based regimen at relapse and using carfilzomib and pomalidomide later. Up until recently, this is essentially where we have been, but where we're going is adding all this red here. So bringing daratumumab earlier, maybe bringing CAR T-cell. I'm get interested to see what, what, what uh, Deepu and Craig and Beth feel about CAR T-cell therapy, maybe supplanting transplant. These new drugs that we'll be talking about coming much earlier into the relapse setting. So we will have an even more complex, but thankfully more options for our patients, uh, dynamic of treating multiple myeloma. Another way to put it is this way. I like tables and, and, and pictures like this to see it visually. The drugs in red are the ones that we're currently using quite extensively. The drugs in green 
are the ones that have just recently been added that we're starting to use more fully. And the drugs in purple at the bottom are the ones that we are um, using uh, or planning and hoping to use in the not so distant future. So you can typically see how drugs start in the more relapse setting and then slowly make their way up earlier and earlier. Uh, and so although we don't have a time today to go through every use of all of these drugs, these ones in red have really become the centerpieces of what we're doing. And we'll talk a bit more about that as we uh, go through. So let's start with frontline therapy. And, and I think it's important when we sit and talk, um, you, you know, Craig and I probably have enough gray hair to remember this, although respectfully, Craig, I, I, don't, I don't see a lot of it, but um, um, uh, to, to remember that when we started treating myeloma 20, 25, 30 years ago, honestly, we didn't have a great expectation. We anticipated that people may live one or two years. Well, now our goals are different. We want to really get a hold of this disease early on because we want to see people live for long periods of time. Not only length, but we want to see people live a good life. We want to see quality of life. And we're coming to appreciate in myeloma how important it is to push off, as it were, that um, relapse for as long as possible. And then, of course, enhance our work altogether so we can do this more effectively. We generally still divide people into transplant eligible and ineligible. And that is not just based on age. That's been something very important in the myeloma world. We could spend a whole hour talking about how we have changed the way we think about comorbidities, as they're called, or the other um, different um, uh, diseases that people have alongside of their myeloma, heart conditions, lung conditions, and how that influences the treatment that we have. But in general, we're still dividing people into transplant eligible and ineligible. And, and this just in from Vincent Rajkumar, he's suggesting in his group, uh, which I was a part of, of course, many years at Mayo Clinic, uh, once you've made that distinction, then we're typically giving a VRD-like like strategy. And so we're going to come back to this notion um, in transplant eligible patients. And those who are not going to transplant, we have either VRD or DRD, but we'll talk a bit more about options there. So to structure our first session, I'm going to ask four questions that I'm going to provide some slides for and then turn to our, uh, to our experts here to give input as to what they think. So the first question is KRD, is KRD which is carfilzomib lenalidomide dex, still an option? In patients who are ineligible for transplant, do we go with DRD or VRD? So bortezomib lenalidomide dex or uh, daratumumab lenalidomide dex. Is it worth adding daratumumab to the combinations we have? And what are we doing classically for maintenance therapy? So the first question is about KRD and VRD. And I mentioned this because this is updated. This was just presented at our ASCO annual meeting virtually in June at what we call the plenary session. So ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, chooses the top four abstracts in all of cancer, not just myeloma. And it's actually very rare for us as myeloma docs to get into the plenary session. You know, it's like we, we, we make the finals here uh, no, no comments, Craig, about uh, sports teams <clears throat> uh, that he and I follow. But um, we made it into the top four here, the final four, as it were. And Shaji Kumar presented this work where we had done this, and I had been involved in this study. It was over 10 years ago that we, we started this study, where we compared bortezomib lendex to carfilzomib lenalidomide dex. And we did so in, very importantly, patients not necessarily planning to go to transplant, who were standard risk. That's an important point here. These were not uh, the high risk patients uh, that we would uh, typically have expected. And the bottom line from the study was that there was really no difference. ARD wasn't necessarily better than VRD um, in the important, what we call primary endpoint, the progression-free survival. Now, that being said, there was a deeper response with the KRD. So we saw more people respond slight with KRD, but it didn't, as we said, translate into progression-free survival. And there was a mix of the side effects. Neuropathy was dramatically higher in the bortezomib group, but there were some cardiac effects, the shortness of breath, the higher blood pressure we saw in the KRD or in the carfilzomib group. So my take on this, and I'm, I'm kind of giving a bit of a spoiler alert, but I will get the, the expert's commentary in a few moments, 
you know, this is really doesn't change very much. It confirms what we do already is that we typically, when we use carfilzomib frontline, we use it in higher risk patients and typically those going to transplant. So this kind of confirmed that in the non-transplant standard risk patient, BRD is probably our standard, but we still have an option of CARD because they were equal uh, together. Uh, and it reminds us that we don't treat myeloma patients as numbers or as diseases, we treat people. And so you have to look at the whole of the patient to know uh, what to do. On the subject of VRD, uh, you know, I can't help but mention, some of you may know this gentleman, Brian Dury, not only my boss, but the chair of the board of the IMF, who led this critical study showing that bortezomib lenalidomide index methazone was better than lenalidomide index methazone. And we mention it now because just published recently was the long-term update that getting that six months or so of bortezomib added to lenalidomide index or Velcade added to Revlimid and Dex really had an impact, not only on progression-free, but overall survival. That in this group of people with just these three drugs, over half of these patients are still alive after seven years. We want to see that number go up, of course, and we have ways to do that. Uh, but let's talk uh, a bit about different uh, ways of doing that. So one was VRD, the other was DRD. So almost a similar study designed to what Dr. Dury did with the VRD, now changing the Velcade to daratumumab or Darzalax. And it's given now not just for six months or so, but actually continuously. So both the daratumumab and the lenalidomide are given indefinitely. And again, quite an impressive progression-free survival. Still a little bit early to comment on overall survival, but this builds on um, other data that we have also just published from the Emory group showing that we can have good long-term outcomes also with VRD. So the question is then, we have DRD is great, VRD is great, but well, what about putting the whole group together? And this Griffin study said, maybe we can add daratumumab to VRD and get the whole group together, a quadruplet as it were, comparing that to the standard VRD. And we saw that it really deepened response. I mean, look at this response rate now up to 99%. Now that's not to say that the VRD response isn't good because you see here it's 92%. That's not, that's not bad at all, that's fantastic, but upgrading it even further, especially in the very deep responses. And notice that this happened over time, that uh, we saw that with multiple lines, of, multiple uh, cycles, that this response was met. And although it's a little bit early to make final conclusions, we can already see that it's delaying more people going into remission, uh, going into relapse, with 96% of people still in remission at two years. I mean, really impressive results. Um, and obviously a little early to comment on overall survival. And then lastly was this master protocol, where if we said that VRD is good, DRD is good, KRD is good, now we can add daratumumab to those combinations. What about daratumumab plus, plus KRD? And this is an interesting study because it not only uses this novel group of drugs together, instead of just giving X number of cycles, it measures the depth of response down to what we call MRD or minimal residual disease negativity and decides from there uh, how much more treatment people will get. So it's, it's a new kind of design. And if I try to put a lot of these together, this isn't a perfect table, but I know there's lots of numbers here, but focus with me on the very last part of this slide where I've, I've put it in red, you can see really incredible depths of response and even MRD negativity when we start to combine all these agents together. Now, of course, you combine agents, it comes with some challenges, and that's what, what I'm gonna come to ask the, the, the experts in a few moments. It isn't just saying, oh, well, we went from doublets to triplets to quadruplets. Do I hear five? Do I hear six? Do I hear seven? You know, we, we wanna be careful because these can be challenging for you as, as patients, of course, with toxicity, not to mention what I call the wallet toxicity, you know, these can be very expensive. But at the same time, if we can find that right balance of enough to get the disease down and let it sleep for many, many years, then that could well be our answer. So let me ask a question to you as the crowd here today. Have you been treated with that subcutaneous or into the skin version of 
daratumumab that's called a Darzalex FASPRO. So I'll get Amira to launch that question and give you an opportunity to, um, to answer. Uh, and maybe quickly, uh, Beth, I'll, I'll jump to you for a quick second and say, have you been giving this at Cleveland Clinic? Um, yes, actually, um, we just added this to our formulary. We are in the process of trying to transition patients over. Um, there's insurance barriers. You can't give it to with every regimen right now. So, for example, Darzalex and um, Carfilzomib is approved, but it's not an approved combination. So, for those who are on those therapies, it's a little bit more challenging with insurance. So I think insurance and financial constraints are a barrier, but overall, uh, most patients wanna change. But for those who have a Metaport that get labs drawn anyhow, some people just wanna stay on the IV. Absolutely, well, thank you for that, Beth, it's true. And actually, I do think that some of those insurance barriers are starting to be overcome. I was able to transition a patient last week um, um, so, and thankfully with the cost of it being very similar in the sub-Q and IV that insurance companies are starting to get on board with that. So it's interesting, I know these numbers aren't huge, but this is a brand new drug that already we see 12% of patients have on, on our line today and we have, you know, well, nearly 400 of you, um, thankfully have, have had the opportunity to be treated with this drug. Um, so that's that's uh, that's great. So just to tell you a bit more, again, this is now FDA approved as Darzalex Fast Pro. If you want to learn more about it, you can go to our uh, IMF website, myloma.org. And as you know, we have information about uh, all of our um, uh, uh, new agents as they as they uh, become approved. So I'm going to make a last a couple of slides about stamina or about maintenance therapy, and then bring it to the group. So. The other thing that was recent also presented at that same ASCO meeting that I mentioned was the stamina study. I won't go into the details of it, but this was a study done several years ago that they're now following up where everybody got a single transplant and then people randomized to three groups to after their transplant, just go to lenalidomide maintenance, to get a second transplant, then go to lenalidomide maintenance, or to get more VRD or Velcade Revlimid Dex and then lenalidomide maintenance. And basically there wasn't a big difference between the three, which is why typically here in the US we're not doing double transplants and we're not always giving a lot of consolidation therapy afterwards. But what was interesting here in this study um, was that when we looked at those patients who stayed on lenalidomide, because the study design let people come off lenalidomide at three years if they wish, not because of toxicity, but just because of desire, that actually staying on lenalidomide really seemed to help keep people in remission for longer. Um, and then furthermore, we have evidence now with ixazomib, which is the, the oral uh, proteasome inhibitor known as Ninlaro. Um, you know, the Laro is the word oral backwards. Uh, Ninlaro to, um, to uh, have evidence through the uh, phase three tourmaline study that this is also another option because not every patient can get or can remain on lenalidomide. So with that rather lengthy introduction, but hopefully a good background, um, let me turn to the experts here. And perhaps I can turn to you, Craig, and say, what is your preferred frontline therapy for myeloma? What are you typically uh, going towards? Um, you know, uh, first, thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, to the the meeting today and i love the imf and and the you know i've been just like you know joe had mentioned i've i have gray hair and i've been here um quite a while and really there's been this incredible evolution of patient empowerment um over the past 15 years when you know i started doing talks <laughs> in the basement of churches about my <laughs> and 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 patients were were really beginning to understand um, to this day when I'm able to discuss you know incredible things with with and the excitement and the new therapies with myeloma. Um, and that's really thanks to to the IMF in empowering our patients. Um, so to, you know, to your question, you know, one thing that that I do is um, I definitely do a risk stratification of patients based on their cytogenetics. And so it's not so much as one size fits all, um, but you know, how, what is the patient's uh, risk um, and kind of what is the pace of their disease and how 
aggressive um, is the myeloma presenting one. And specifically when patients have um, the high risk features, uh, the deletion 17, the 414, um, the 14, 16, 14, 20 translocations, then I lend to a more aggressive argument with deeper res, um, responses, um, such as the KRDs or the DARA RVDs and up. Um, the other thing that I'm very mindful of is when patients have this new box um, um, with a double hit. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, and the addition of chromosome one is the other high risk feature, I'm sorry. Um, but when patients have the double hit um, uh, and sometimes triple hit, where they have combinations of those high risk features, then I, I again, I, I lend to more of the KRDs, um, which you know in the endurance trial showed that compared to RVD had at least deeper responses. And, and really I'm starting to move to you know, the, the four drug therapies. And, I'm very thankful that that we've been able to get insurance approval for uh, for that for the higher risk patients and even with fast pro um, just just recently. Wonderful. Um, that's that's so extremely. So it sounds like to you distinguishing high risk from standard risk is really important. You, you tend to go to more uh, KRD like regimens in the higher risk patients. Well, well deep. Let me ask you, and we're so glad to have you with us today. Do you think we're on the verge of going from triplets to quadruplets? I know you were at our International Myeloma Working Group Summit a few weeks ago where this was a hot topic. Um, what is your take on this? Do you think we're going from three to four? Yeah, I actually, oh, thank you guys for having me here today. It's really fun and it's nice to have all my friends here as well. And some of my patients joined, they told me they were coming in. So hi to all of them. Um, actually, at Sinai, I, we do the same thing in terms of cytogenetics. We look at high risk versus standard risk. And for some patients, you know, most standard risk would do VRD. But then if you have some high risk patients, we're actually doing a quadruplet therapy on them. So DARA VRD more than KRD. I typically don't go to KRD first line unless, you know, I've tried VRD and then they're just blowing through it or they're progressing very quickly. But I think we are getting more and more patients on DARA VRD. And I've had a couple of patients on the trial that you talked about where they did DARA VRD and they're still in remission like three years mm -hmm. out. So it's showing great responses. So I'm kind of leaning towards more quadruplets, but you know, the issue is you use up all four drugs up front, then what do you do when you relapse? You know, it's kind of one of the questions that's coming about, but that's something to think about. Sure, absolutely. And we'll come to that when we talk to relapse. So so Beth, maybe I get a focus question number three here a little bit for you and, and ask this scenario. You have a patient that is not really planning to go to a, a stem cell transplant for whatever reasons that have been determined. And you've got kind of at your disposal a VRD or DRD. You've determined that you probably won't give them KRD. What makes you choose VRD, so Velcade Revlimidex versus Daratumab Revlimidex? Oh, that's that's an easy question. Thank you, Dr. McHale, for asking me such an easy question. Uh, really, just as the panel said, you know, we look at the risk, and if they have standard risk, um, and think about that patient that, based on the Maya trial data, you would do DR, DRD. I mean, they do pretty well, but I think I worry about that upfront daratumumab, especially if people have lung problems, if they're a little bit more frail, and VRD does very well. In 20 years I've been at the clinic, we participated in the SWOG 777 study, and I still have patients that are in remission, and that was from 2007. So I think based on the years of experience and um, keeping patients on therapy is going to be the most important thing rather than stopping therapy. Um, so I, I think I, we use a lot of VRD and are hesitant to use the DARA up front okay. in standard Great. risk. Great. And then lastly, um, maybe I'll come back to you, Deepu, maintenance therapy, what's your strategy at Sinai? Yeah, so we, everybody gets maintenance therapy after transplant, as long as you know it's something that they can tolerate Revlimid um, for, but the majority of them go on lenalidomide. If you have somebody with high risk, um, we do the triplet regimen with like Linlaro, Revlimid, Dex for a set number of time, do another bone marrow biopsy at the end of their year and see if they're MRD negative. But we typically continue maintenance therapy for at least three years. And we 
going if they can tolerate it without any issues. So you have okay, to make sure for, them for NDS Unless and other things. Want... Other... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I think my internet's weird. Uh, I just said we oh, do that's... screen with bone marrow biopsy every year just to make sure that you know they're continue to stay in remission. You know, because what we've raised here are some great questions, because thank you for the patients that have submitted some explicit questions, and we'll try and identify them now. Um, and don't worry, we're not we're not behind. We know that this first section was going to be the longest section, but some asked if, uh, one asked if translocation 414, uh, how does that fit? And, and translocation 414 has been a little bit of an unusual um, uh, cytogenetic marker that some have considered it high risk, some have put it in even, even its own category of intermediate risk. And the reason for that is it appears that patients who have that are particularly sensitive to proteasome inhibitors, mm -hmm. be it Velcade or or Kyprolis, Carfilzomib, and, and, and then Lara as well, the Exazomib. So, so that's why they were actually still included in the endurance study because that wasn't thought of as the high risk feature. Another great question was, do we know about the quad treatments, the four drugs in transplant ineligible? No, that work is being done now, but we don't really have enough data yet to comment on it. And then uh, a few more questions. One was a great question saying, and I think Deepu, you, you made reference to this as well, is, you know, if someone is MRD negative, does that mean they're going to stay MRD negative forever? Um, or, or how do we put that into a dynamic? And and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Deepu, but I think our prevailing thinking now is that you know, MRD negativity is obviously a very good target and goal, but maintaining it may be even a more important target and goal that, that high-risk patients, unfortunately, seem to be able to get to MRD negativity and re relapse more quickly. So we may be looking at the future of strategies of saying, you get to MRD and then what's your so-called MRD 12, meaning 12 months later, are you still in MRD negativity? Is that your approach to it as well, Deepu? Yeah, that's what we do. We typically, especially if they're on maintenance, we do a bone marrow biopsy every year. So like MRD 12 and then another year from there, so 24. And so we're checking and seeing if they continue to stay in promotion. And then Beth, I'll ask you, I know you said you're just in the midst of transitioning, but someone has asked if, if you've seen headaches after giving FASPRO, giving Darzalex subcutaneously. Uh, thank you. The, um, we have been using this in clinical trials with smoldering myeloma and amyloidosis prior to the FDA approval. So um, I think for the last few years, I have significant experience and we have had very few people have headaches. And I'm not sure if that's due to the pre-medication on Dancitron, you know, the 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, or is it actually from the FASPRO itself? Um, so that's unclear. The hyaluronidase might um, have some of that as a side effect, but I have seen a couple people, but I'm not sure what it's related to, unfortunately. So we just peel the pre-meds away eventually. Yeah, that, and I think that's a that's another point. So for this patient who's asking, obviously they can discuss it with their physician because it, it could be other things. But I, I do really want to emphasize what you said, Beth. I mean, you are really one of the, if not the world expert in understanding so much of the supportive care around what we do in myelomas. I joke sometimes with the nurse practitioner I work with, Susie, who's just fantastic, that we're gonna rename our myeloma consult service the dexamethasone reduction service, the DRF, <laughs> because I am consistently finding patients in whom they're still getting all these pre-meds before their Darzalex six, seven mm -hmm. months out, or people who are still on 40 milligrams once a week. We have good data now to show us that, you know, I tell patients that the dexamethasone are like booster rockets on the shuttle really helpful for those first few months but we've got to get them down because with time it causes more grief than help so mm -hmm. feel free to use that analogy anybody who wants to use it and then craig last question for you is someone has asked do we have evidence of pomalidomide maintenance being something of value and is it something that you ever use um, definitely when, um, you know, we don't have a lot of experience up front with pomalidomide, um, and it really has been, REV has been the kind of go-to maintenance drug. Definitely um, at relapse, when patients relapse and then we use pomalidomide, then we've been using pomalidomide as maintenance, like on first relapse, when we're using KPD or Kyprolis Pomdex, or when we're using Dara Pomdex, or even Quadruplets. Um, 
and um, and relapse, uh, then part of the backbone of that is definitely pomalidomide. Okay, great. And then the last question, I'll address it real quickly, was someone was asking, or someone's asked about CAR-T, but hold on, we'll come to it. Uh, but the other question was, um, do we have many comments about DARA KRD or even Isatuximab or Sarclisa, the new CD38 that I'm gonna talk about in a moment, with KRD up front? Look, I had to save something for next PFS. Um, so, so the data there is just a little bit less mature than what we presented, mm -hmm. but absolutely, some very big studies involved with that, and I think ultimately it's going to be helpful to have many more options for what we provide our patients. Well, with that segue, let's move into the concept of relapse disease, and we've talked uh, already a little bit about this concept, and 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 uh, Deepu had mentioned it, and as had Beth specifically in using um, subcutaneous Darzalex that it isn't in this indication. But one of those approvals that I just showed us at the start of the session was the CANDOR study, which we thought it was a very important step forward, where um, in this new design that we're in, we're often trying to find the best partner for carfilzomib being a very potent drug, Kyprolis, and now being able to combine it with Daratumab, especially after someone's had the classic VRD-like first therapy, uh, at first relapse, what can we give them? And a DARA KRD was validated by this CANDOR study where you can see there was a significant benefit of adding uh, daratumumab to uh, carfilzomib and dexamethasone. Uh, and, and so this was, again, just recently FDA approved. Uh, many of you I, I know have been treated with carfilzomib or kyprolis. Um, and, and what's very attractive about this combination, of course, is with most people, as we've just heard Deepu and Craig say, most people being on lenalidomide maintenance. Uh, to, to use a non-lenalidomide containing regimen can be very important, um, and, and sometimes even uh, uh, without using that whole class of drugs, although we often use clomalidomide at first relapse, as you'll see, um, it will be uh, important to, to consider this kind of regimen. Um, and in this regimen, we have the choice, the FDA has given the choice to give the Kyprolis either twice weekly or once weekly. I can tell you in my practice, I'm typically giving it weekly in almost everybody because we found it to be just as effective, if not more effective, obviously more convenient for patients without significantly more side effects. Now, not coming far behind, and my, uh, my caveat or my conflict here is that I was uh, an author on this paper and we presented this at a late breaking abstract. So for those who aren't familiar with it at our big meetings, we have ASCO and then we had EHA or the European Hematology Association when a big major trial is just getting new results in, it can make its way into what's called the late breaking abstract session, the, the what I call the this just in session. And we presented esetuximab with carfilzomib and dex. So similar in some ways to the CANDOR study, a big phase three study, where again, very impressive ability to combine this new CD38 antibody, esetuximab or sarclisa with, um, with KRD, um, uh, with KD, I'm sorry, with carfilzomib uh, uh, and dexamethasone. And so again, you know, having more choice is helpful. Um, obviously, we do not yet have a subcutaneous version of this drug. We still give it intravenously, but over a considerably shorter time frame, it's given about uh, just under four hours the first time, about two hours the second time, and then thereafter only 75 minutes for each mm -hmm. uh, subsequent infusion. And so um, we, we already have it approved with pomalidomide index, uh, but as I indicated from the start, we may likely have it in this combination soon. Other combinations that were newly presented in the early relapse was now bringing Selenexor, and I know Beth and I have been working a lot with Selenexor. Of course, you have Deepu as well. Sinai was one of the biggest sites of using the Selenexor agent, but now trying to see can we use it in combination with something else, in particular with bortezomib, and I think a very important study because it was the first major phase three study to give the bortezomib once weekly. Um, and so when it was given in that way, we see definitely a benefit of adding Selenexor to it. And not only see the benefit, we actually saw that there was less side effects than some of the side effects that we see when the drug is given uh, twice weekly. And, mm -hmm. and Beth and I wrote a paper this last year trying to help doctors know how to use Selenexor. Sometimes say, I don't give Selenexor until I give it with the three musketeers. You know, it has to be given with dexamethasone, with a 5-HT3 antagonist, something like ondansetron. And we use a lot of olanzapine because I find that really helps. And there are even other uh, anti-nauseants that I know the Sinai group uses as well. 
So Expovio has really, I think, now proven itself not just to be a drug that can that can hold its own by itself, but can be used in combination. Which brings us to our next question for the crowd, which is, have you been treated with Expovio? Have you been treated with a Selenexor? And quickly, maybe while they're answering that, Deepu, if I can ask you, um, um, are you using Selenexor in combination now or still primarily using it a single agent? Yeah, no, so since it got FDA approved, um, we've been using it in combination and very rarely as a single agent. And like you said, patients can't tolerate it twice a week dosing. And so we give either 40 or even 60 milligrams, but either with Velke, Dara, or something that they haven't seen before or something that they're having combination. So similar to the Boston study, um, but just in the various combination. But like you said, um, supportive care is the key. Um, these patients need to really be monitored closely. And so if they're doing it locally, we also do something similar to what you've done. We give them a cheat sheet of they should be on this drug, this drug, you know, like three nausea medications. They should get fluids and have them come into clinic twice a week in the beginning, make sure they're checking their sodium levels because they may need salt tabs. So supportive key is the uh, supportive care is the key for somebody to continue to maintain themselves on Selenexor. Okay, thank you. Well, it, it appears that we don't have a lot of our crowd today on Selenexor, but I suspect that this will change with time um, as we use it, just as you've said, Deepu, in combination. I think it's one of these drugs where people need to get greater comfort to it. I've sometimes described it as a Mack truck, very potent, but you got to learn how to drive it. And, and someone just asked a question about similarly with Kyprolis and the cardiac effects. You know, I remember writing a paper a number of years ago on this exact point where I sometimes joke and say that the, um, not to mix analogies too much, but that Kyprolis is sometimes like like the Ferrari, not that I drive a Ferrari, but, but that it's also very potent, but you have to learn how to drive it. I think people mm -hmm. are getting, and doctors are getting more comfortable using these drugs, knowing how to negotiate the side effects and reduce them from the start, so that will hopefully help people uh, in the in the future. All right, time as always goes very quickly. So um, we now looking again to the recommendations that Vincent and others have given us, you know, as the list starts to get longer now, and a lot of it has to do with, are you refractory to lenalidomide or not in the way that you uh, approach it? So, so a few quick questions here before we get to novel agents. Um, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Beth. What is your preferred first relapse? Like what do you, if you've got that patient that's, pretty well done the classic VRD, let's say transplant and land maintenance, what is your go-to regimen right now? Uh, that's an excellent question because it depends on what the genetics of the disease are, are they high risk or low risk? Assuming that since about 80% of folks are standard risk disease and they had VRD up front, maybe they didn't have an upfront transplant though, because we don't always offer an up, well we offer a transplant but they don't always get a transplant. So maybe we'll reinduce them with like a, a Kyprolis based regimen and then go to transplant and then oftentimes keep them in remission with whatever got them into remission the first place. But it really depends. Uh, clinical trials, I can't say enough about the importance of participating in clinical trials. That is definitely our first, we try to steer people towards these wonderful drugs because we didn't get where we are right now without using those clinical trial results. Indeed. Yeah. So, so Craig, maybe I can narrow the question because someone asked this explicitly as well. You have a patient who had a transplant and LEN maintenance, and you're trying to decide between daratumumab palm dex versus daratumumab carfilzomib dex. What makes Professor Cole go one way or the other? I've been um, um, kind of leaning towards doing the 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 fast pro Dara carfilzomib dex in patients that have been on Rev maintenance um, before, and I I will do, and depending on kind of just like Beth said what their risk is, um, you know we are submitting um, a uh, an abstract at Ash this year on using Dara Palm Carfilzomib Dex um, for relapse therapy. And it's, and again, it's in a clinical trial. Um, so um, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that to everyone, but for some of the higher risk, more symptomatic relapses, 
um, you know, I'll go to Dara um, with via FASPRO, um, Carpilzum of Dex, and then sort of do a, a either if they're, you know, high risk, I'll may add the, I'll have the palm on at the beginning. And if, and when I do, you know, um, there are um, response adapted therapy, I may add the palm on to drive their response down deeper. Wow. So you heard it here folks, first, folks, that Craig is starting to advocate for quadruplets at first relapse. And I do think that is a way that we're going to be going before too long. It'd be interesting once we get Dara, per se, in the front first four. And then do you want to use a quadruplet that's not Dara containing? Are we going to be doing you know, carfilzomib palm decks with, say, Selenexor or something like that. I, I, mm-hmm. Let's save that for next year. But but th- that that is important discussion. Um, so, so, so Deepu, maybe I can turn to you and just ask about the isatuximab. You know, we know that this is another CD38 antibody, very potent in and of itself as even a single agent, even though that's not its indication. Do you foresee us using more isatuximab in the near future? Do you think this isatuximab carfilzomib dex will be an attractive combination? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think just like Selenexor, we have to get more and more comfortable with isatuximab. It's like here, it's your habit, right? You've given Dara, you're so familiar with Dara, kind of like how it took a long time for Nilaro to take off and sometimes still struggles because Velcade is so popular. So I feel like Isa is like that second second kid sometimes or the middle child who's ignored, but I think it should be moving more and more up front. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens in DARA failures, right? People if you're using quadruplets like we are for first line and you save ESA palm for second line, are you gonna have response for C38 failures? Mm. So I think there's a lot we have to still learn from it, but I think ESA K, the the combination looks really good. I agree with you. I think I think learning more about that um, CD38 resistance, as we often are calling it, you know, what happens when someone progresses on DARA. You know, we have some evidence that if you give them a, a CD38 holiday, you know, maybe give them six months off with a different regimen, we may be able to come back to that same C38 or, you know, Eastuximab does affect a different epitope. Maybe it could go in a different way. Okay, we're going to have to move on to our next one because we've kind of answered question three, but I will note a few other questions that have come in. One asked, you know, why, why do we want to get people off of DEX? Well, I think we have good evidence now. And there was an Italian study that compared people getting Rev DEX uh, briefly and then just staying on the Revlimid versus staying on RevDex continuously, that actually showed that the Revlimid alone arm did better. Uh, I think, mm-hmm. and going back to that booster rocket analogy, it, with time it just seems to cause more trouble, more blood sugar, mm-hmm. more blood pressure challenges. Not every patient, some people, one person mentioned that, that the DEX is working for them and, and I don't want to interfere with any one individual's case, uh, but I, I do think that that's um, an important uh, notion. Okay, so we're going to wrap up this session. I told us this first session was probably going to take an hour, so we're right on schedule. And this is, uh, for those of you who have been waiting on the edge of your seat, this is Get Your Popcorn, uh, um, if you do eat popcorn first thing in the morning. Um, and this is, is what we're going to talk about, these new immune therapies, of which the first is Belantamam Aphidotin, as we mentioned, just approved a couple months ago. Um, and to make it simple, this is what we call an antibody drug conjugate. So you remember... Drugs like daratumab and isatuximab we were just talking about are monoclonal antibodies. So they hook onto something on the outside of the myeloma cell and trigger the immune system to destroy it. Here, this drug does two things. It also hooks on now at a different part called BCMA, which you're gonna hear a lot about in the near future, so get used to it, B cell maturation antigen. Think of it as just a hook on the side of the myeloma cell that a drug can grab onto. But it also has a second feature, so it grabs on, triggers the immune system in the area and and through multiple means, but it also has attached to it a little toxin, a little smart bomb, as it were, that kind of drops into the cell, this MMAF, as you see here on the side, and it drops it into the cell to help further the cell kill in that particular area. And this was based on the DREAM2 study. They have a whole series of studies called DREAM2. A lot of dream in here, dream two, dream six, dream nine. So there'll be lots of dreams coming. Uh, and we saw in this cohort of patients that we saw this 31% response rate of the 2.5 milligrams per kilogram, which really puts it in the category of all the major agents we're using. You know, we saw 
29% with Daratumab, 25 to 26% with Selenexor, 25% with Carfilzomab. I mean, these are all in that range. Uh, Isatuximab, 28%. So, so this is very exciting for us. And this drug was just approved. And at our International Myeloma Working Group, there was a lot of enthusiasm about this drug. I don't want to temper the enthusiasm too much, but we're still sorting out this thing called keratopathy, where that toxin that gets dropped in, for reasons we don't fully understand, can accumulate a little bit in the cornea, the outside of the eye. And so a majority of patients, if we look for it, we find it. Thankfully, only a minority, about a quarter of patients have blurred vision or some kind of impairment of their vision. Uh, we're learning maybe a little bit more about dose holding and, and waiting a while, but the way the drug is now approved you have to see an eye expert, be it an ophthalmologist or an optometrist, before each dose. So they can measure and make sure that there isn't any evidence of that or keep an eye, no pun intended, on what is uh, going on in the cornea. So for me, my take, this is exciting. This is the first BCMA drug. The response rates are impressive. But we have to be aware of this corneal toxicity. Um, and, and we have to be able to monitor it carefully and decide when to hold or discontinue the drug. It does seem to be reversible in the majority of patients. Um, and I think this drug will be very important, like every other drug, when we start to see um, it combined with other agents. So, so pretty exciting stuff. So I know that it's brand new. I don't expect big numbers here, but let me, let me um, uh, uh, ask this question. Have you been treated with Blenrep with Valantamab, Mafodotin? And while they're answering, Beth, um, can I get your take on the keratopathy here? Well, Dr. McHale, I think this is a, a tough, tough discussion to have um, with the eye thing. I think initially we looked to the clinical trial data and the, you know, 70% can experience and much of it can be reversed. Uh, we did ex we did uh, participate in the expanded access program and had some people that had some uh, challenges. Um, I think we just need to be upfront as providers and say, you know, this is a real thing. Um, let's get you in with an eye doctor. We have a pathway that we're creating at our institution, and we have very excellent eye doctors that we will get our patients to. We will try to protect them, and if this drug is right for them, the eye thing should not scare anybody away. Excellent. Okay. Well, again, we didn't expect a big number here, 2%, but tells us that there's been some. I mean, the drug is brand new. And honestly, um, uh, if you're outside the previous clinical trials, the drug is still being delivered to different pharmacies across the country. So I know that most people can't get onto this and will probably not be able to get onto it until later in October, if not early November. But I just wanted to see if there were some who had been um, exposed to the drug already. Okay, great. I'll keep moving here. Um, I do see a few questions that have come in. One is an interesting question, which is, do you ever recommend using a second transplant? Um, and so keep that in the back of your minds, group. Uh, I'll come back to that at the Q&A. Well, here is, here is the next bit. So I am by no means going to turn into Charlie Brown's teacher here, wah, 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 go through all this data. But we had three major important studies looking at CAR T cell therapy presented at our meetings at ASCO and Ash and EHA. The uh, BB2121 study, the CAR to dude study, where you see Deepu's name there, and indeed the Orvacel uh, study, the Evolve study. And, and we've tried to sort of lump them together in this, and uh, thanks to, to uh, our, our colleagues, uh, Karina Patel at, at MD Anderson, who, who made this chart and allowed me to use it today. That first of all, I want you to notice these are people with very advanced myeloma. I mean, on average, six prior lines of therapy. Almost all of these patients are so-called triple refractory, where they've had proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, and, and monoclonal antibodies. So they've had the, the MIDs, the MIBs, and the MABs, um, and have progressed on them. And yet, look on the right here, we see unbelievable response rates between 75 and 100%. I know some of these numbers are a bit small early on, but I know Duke Deepu can tell us more about this in a moment. There is still issues. We don't want to make it sound like uh, there's no neurological toxicity. One of the questions came in about neurotoxicity, and I'll get you to comment on it in a minute, Deepu. So these drugs do come with challenges, but it seems to me every time these are presented, we're seeing, as you'll see here from my take, we're seeing safer administration of, of this. We're learning about it just like we've been saying all day today with all these different drugs. There's a learning curve 
for all of us. So this is really exciting. I mean, these kinds of response rates are almost unheard of. Not to mention this notion of kind of being one and done. I had a patient I just saw a couple of weeks ago. We did his CAR T cell therapy 18 months ago. And this man was frankly incredibly sick then. And he says, Doc, this is the best I've ever felt. I have no chemo brain. He goes, I love you, but I'm glad I'm not seeing you all the time. And, and he's doing really quite well. And he's not the only one. Many of us have a lot of patients like that in our practice. And we hope to be able to see this in the not so distant future. But to close off this session before we have some questions, there is also another whole set of drugs coming. So if CAR T cell therapy is the therapy where we take T cells from you and we multiply them in the lab and, if you will, train them to attack your tumor and give them back to you, it's very effective, but it does take that whole process of taking the T cells out, manufacturing them, giving them back to you, and, and there are some challenges with that. Can we do that so-called off the shelf, meaning with just a drug that we pull off the shelf instead of having to take your T cells out? So these, I mentioned earlier that monoclonal antibodies hook onto something in the cell to help destroy the myeloma. These are like two armed antibodies that hook onto the cell, but also hook onto a T cell nearby. So it's like, hey, let me introduce you to T cell over here. You know, let, let's let's get the T cell involved, and so that the T cell can do a couple things. One, it can actually stimulate the T cell to make more of itself, to have more T cells, but also to engage into the into the tumor cell and destroy it locally. So you don't have to go through all the hassle of the collection and the manufacturing and the and, and the reinsertion. And so the first of these study, well, not the first of them, the most recently presented study was teclistamab where we started to see at their full doses, significant response rates. Now there's still some challenges, like with, with CAR T cell therapy, with these cytokine release syndromes, but really quite impressive results. And I just showed you one study. Amgen has been leading the way in the earliest of studies. We have a whole series of companies working in this field, even so-called tri-specifics, where it has three mm -hmm. arms to grab two parts of the tumor along with the T cells. Um, so I, I think it's really impressive to see these molecules come. It's a little bit early to, to talk about how long it lasts, but these drugs are given continuously. And I really think this is important. It may be a bit challenging to start in the community because people are still generally being admitted the first time they get this drug, but I think it's going to make a, a difference. And before we go to the Q&A, let me toss in two other drugs that I think are very important and sometimes get forgotten in the midst of the excitement of immunotherapy, the cell mods and the uh, and mel melflan flufenamide, as you heard me call earlier, the artist formerly known as melflufen, which are really new drugs. So cell mods, if you will, are kind of like a next generation immunomodulatory drugs that are cutting their teeth, showing that they can overcome the resistance to pomalidomide, because we use lenalidomide and pomalidomide so uh, um, uh, regularly that eventually patients, of course, become resistant to that. And this ibertamide drug, really quite impressive as you see here, uh, with the opportunity to see response rates, and again, in that 30-ish percent range in people who are truly refractory to, to pomalidomide and lenalidomide. And lastly, this melphalan, and you think, whoa, melphalan, are we going old school here? Like, where's Will Ferrell? Are, are we going old school? Well, it, it's not... If you don't understand the Will Ferrell analogy, my, my apologies, but um, it's actually not so much old school. It's old school in the sense that we know melphalan is one of the most potent single agent drugs we have in myeloma, but this is a novel way of delivering it into the cell, much safer for the patient and perhaps more even uh, effective at that payload reduction. So it's a much safer way of doing it. And the Horizon study showed us, again, look at these response rates in that 30% range in people who are truly triple class refractory. So we have a wealth of options coming to us. We have these four major pillars right now, the proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, monoclonal antibodies, and alkylators. We've just added selenexor and volantamab, and we may, before too long, add more of these novel agents and CAR T cell therapy to have eight major pillars to the way we treat myeloma. All right, we're at the one hour mark, but we'll just take a few more minutes to answer these questions because I think it's important. And let me ask the group and Craig, maybe start with you. You know, do you think that benitamab is really going to be the go-to drug for triple class refractory myeloma right now? Yes, um, and I think, you know, we're involved with the dream studies here. Um, 
with um, uh, blenantamab and Valcade and the blenantamab rev. Um, and some of that data was also recently presented showing, you know, really good response rates um, and, and really well tolerated. Um, the one thing about, you know, the blenantamab, at least in the DREAM6 studies, is that they have different dosing um, schedules. And actually some of the, the dosing schedules have a decrease the um, uh, the keratopathy or the eye toxicity, and and actually I was really surprised when we were opening that trial and having patients on it that the eye doctor appointments it seems you know very um, uh, like a, a big pain in the rear, um, but actually it was it was pretty easy for patients and we didn't have thank goodness we didn't we had really good responses um, didn't have a lot of toxicity. And the patients kind of saw their eye doctor and went. I mean, and so I think that, you know, and especially targeting BCMA, um, that I think that for, I think in combination that that will, when the clinical trials mature a bit, that that will be a, a really potent drug in triple class refractory. And of course, it'll make its way uh, up uh, yeah. down to second and first. Maybe yeah, that's first. really helpful. So one of the questions came in saying, you know, what percentage of patients do, does the eye toxicity go away? And we know that when the drug is stopped, mm -hmm. almost everybody has it go away. But when it's held for a period of time, we saw we saw a lot of patients where the toxicity reduced, but they actually stayed in remission. So yes. yeah. I think that will help us inform a bit about the dosing before too long. Um, all right, Deepu, you know that this is coming, uh, CAR T-cell queen that you are. Um, so, you know, what's going on with CAR-T? A couple of questions are here saying... You know, do we have long-term uh, outcomes from this? Is it going to replace transplants? You know, excuse me, what's your take on how CAR-T is going to affect the way we treat myeloma? Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing I should say about CAR-T is it is a one-time treatment. And I have patients who tell me who prefer to go to CAR-T versus transplant. I had a guy who had a CAR-T just like your patient told me, I feel better than ever. He's traveling and he's like, I would do like seven CAR-Ts over like another transplant, you know, because these patients do feel sick. I mean, the response rates we're seeing are great. These are relapse refractory patients who've had, you know, an average of five, six lines. And some of the patients on there have had 12 to 18 prior lines of therapy, right? And they're seeing response rates in the 80 to 100%. So I think it's a very good therapy. And now it's moving closer and closer to frontline therapy. So a lot of the trials, the KARMA2, the CARTITUDE studies are, if you failed your first line, then you get, you know, then you can go to CAR-T versus doing uh, standard of care, or you have the phase three trials where they are randomizing dara palm versus CAR-T. And I know the KARMA3 and CARTITUDE4 study are in frontline. So you go BRD and then transplant versus um, be, yeah, pretty well across the board. We're going to start to see this used. One one person asked, you know, what about patients in their seventies? I know that you've done CAR Ts in a lot of patients. As we said before, we don't want to be ageist. I tell you, I got a seventy-six year old in my practice who can outcycle any of the four of us on this on this call. So so we don't want to be ageist, but. But I think we want to have people understand that that older patients can indeed be candidates for these drugs too. Yeah, so we actually trans, uh, did a CAR-T on a 79-year-old who tolerated it really well. Like you said, age is just a number. These, you know, this patient could probably do more running and sitting up than I can. So, you know, it's just a number and it's very, very safe. CRS, most patients have, but it's very low grade cytokine release syndrome, the side effect that you can get, but very manageable with the therapies that we have. Neurotoxicity is actually quite um, little. It's only about 10% or so compared to the Yaskarta studies with the lymphoma. I think a lot of people, when you talk about CAR-T, think about the lymphoma CAR-T and say, oh, it's a little bit more toxic or there's more neurotoxicity and they just extrapolate this to myeloma data. But our myeloma CAR-Ts are pretty safe, very manageable, um, pretty reversible with the antidotes that we have for the toxicities. Fantastic, helpful. All right, Beth, I'm coming to you for question three because one of the questions that came in, which I think is important, and I know we've discussed this a lot, a lot in the International Myeloma Working Group has been you know, is it is it going to be bispecifics? Is it going to be antibody drug conjugates, or is it going to be CAR T? Do we really have to choose one, or is it all of them? I think we do have emerging evidence that 
even if someone has seen one BCMA drug, it looks like we can use another BCMA drug. We had that talk earlier about CD38, but BCMA seems to be a little bit more preserved over the course of someone's life. But is this where Beth is going to bet on one of the three horses, or are you going for all three horses, as it were? First of all, I'd like to say it just blows my mind. When I started managing patients in the mid-1990s with myeloma, we had like that, infusional in your port, hospitalized for five days, that's it, or transplant. And so now- So Beth, you were treating people when you were 10 years old? Absolutely. I was okay, still okay. 12. I but... wanted to clarify that. Thank you. <laughs> but it was so easy to learn myeloma back then because there was nothing to learn. And oh my goodness. Now, what are we going to be talking about in five years? That's what I want to know. I want to fast forward five years and see what that discussion looks like. To answer your question, I think it's we're going to have to find out the right drug for each person. You said before, and I say it all the time, we treat people, not numbers. We use those numbers to inform our recommendations and decision making, but I think we're going to have to use it all in different parts of the disease. It's not going to be just CAR T or bispecific. It's going to be all of them, including our standard therapy. Somebody might just want to take an easy peasy vanilla VRD, and that's okay because you still can have an 80, 90% response rate and a good quality of life. You're just going to be taking therapy for a little bit longer. Yeah, and I, I think we are going to learn that there is no perfect sequence, just like there is now, right? Someone says to me all the time, what's your standard second line? I know it all depends, right? You know, you, you don't, you, we don't predetermine someone's whole myeloma career at their diagnosis. And so I think that concept is important. Even that person who asked, should I get a second transplant? Some patients, it can really be helpful. You know, if someone has responded to their first one, had a long remission after it, they tolerated it well. Some patients are like, no doc, no, don't do it. I am not going back to a second transplant. But if, if, if it's, it is an option in a disease that we've not yet cured, we want options. And I hope there's an optimism that comes through this talk today that patients listening understand every drug comes with challenges. This myeloma is still an awful disease. You're gonna hear shortly from Susie and Robin, I'm getting excited to hear them about what they can do, what we can do in supporting each other on not just a drug, if you will, basis. But that being said, we really are seeing a tremendous number of options coming to patients as we go forward. All right, well, uh, we've covered, I've tried to answer just about all the questions as we've gone through, which is great. Now, let's just take a few minutes to talk about COVID-19. I, I purposely plan not to discuss this for very long because I think we're all in some ways COVIDed out. This is such a, a challenging time uh, with COVID uh, and I try never to make it political and just focus on the reality that this is a virus that is affecting so many people. And Deepu is a local expert here by virtue of uh, the role that Sinai played. So I'm just going to share a couple of things. I mean, these are thoughts you have heard before. Um, and, you know, I, I would be irresponsible if I didn't reiterate the importance of wearing masks. And uh, I love the way Dr. Dury himself always says he doesn't like the word social distancing. He likes the word physical distancing and social networking, meaning that it's important for us to network with those that we love sometimes electronically. I, I love these three people with me. I haven't been able to, to physically see them in many, many months, but I feel close to them and it gives me an opportunity, importance of hand washing. Uh, and, and I think one of the reasons why we've not seen as many myeloma patients around the world getting COVID uh, is that our patients do understand some of these principles and do know how to protect themselves. Yes, a cancer diagnosis puts people at slight increased risk, but we're gonna hear in a moment from Deepu a little bit more about this, we have had a working group through the International Myeloma Working Group that Dr. Dury has led, where we have looked at cases. It's remarkable actually how few cases there have been in Asia. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the US being one of the highest hit countries early on, we saw a lot of cases here that, that we're gonna reference in just a moment, but even here, Arizona, at one point we were the peak. We had just under 400 COVID patients in my hospital alone, 392 at our peak. Um, but thankfully, uh, we didn't see any of our myeloma patients succumb to this disease, although we had some, of course, that were diagnosed with it. So Deepu, let me share a few of her slides here. I hate to speak on your behalf, Deepu, but I'll come to you right for the Q&A, but she's just published a paper looking at their experience that they've had there and saw, I had the privilege of chairing a COVID series in the middle of this challenging time in March and April, 
where uh, speaking to so many ICU doctors, some from Sinai even, uh, that very much so that a very advanced age, obesity and cardiovascular risk were some of the highest risk factors. But by contrast, you know, being able to have people's myeloma under control really put them at lower risk. Um, I think it's also important for us to recognize that. Sometimes I've used this analogy, it's not perfect, but you know, if you're in the jungle and a lion is about to jump on you, you're maybe not as worried if there happens to be a snake in the bush that you're going to jump into, meaning the myeloma is right there. We want to make sure we control the myeloma. The myeloma is ravaging your immune system more than you might think. Uh, but nonetheless, we also want to be careful that we don't go out of the frying pan to the fire, as it were, like trying to jump away from a from a lion, we end up in the snake's uh, arms as well, or mouth. Um, so, so Deepo, I'll get you to comment on this in just a minute, but you, you did see, unfortunately, some of the highest mortality in the world because you were at the forefront when we, we didn't really fully understand this virus, not that we do now, but at least we understand it a bit better now and have more treatments for, it, uh, for us um, uh, and for it as we go forward. So some key takeaways is, you know, we're still understanding this virus. This is not a simple, uh, I can say it when your name is Joe, average Joe virus. You know, this is very complex. Uh, we do see that it's still primarily airborne, but there can be, of course, asymptomatic spread as we've heard. We need to take adjustments. Although at the short term, we were making some adjustments for myeloma, we've come to appreciate that we really want to control people's myeloma. We don't want to let it. I have, happened to live through SARS when we had it in Toronto and it was disturbing when a lot of patients didn't get their treatment and then by the end of SARS, their disease had very much advanced. So we, we don't want to under treat you as well, although sometimes we had to delay transplants and delay certain therapies. Telehealth has revolutionized what we're doing. I think telehealth is here to stay. Um, I listened to this outstanding lecture last weekend by a certain Dr. Feynman who happens to be related to our own Dr. Feynman here, uh, who's the telehealth expert at Cleveland Clinic. And it, I really do think uh, it's value. I see more patients now than ever electronically uh, than I did in person as I do consults around the world. We still don't know the long-term impact of this condition. But before we go to the Q&A uh, for us, I do want to remind people that we can uh, learn more about this at the uh, myeloma, at the IMF website at myeloma.org. And I'm just interested in asking our group listening today, have you had uh, a telemedicine a virtual uh, uh, interaction with your physicians for your myeloma, be it through a Zoom or, or different systems? Uh, have you been doing this? Um, has this been a part of your care? And while that's being asked, uh, Deepo, I have to turn to you because you're, you're truly the, the expert in our crowd here, even though I know we've had lots of cases, sadly, in all of the cities represented. You perhaps had the most in the early phase. Um, what is your take on uh, what we've described here and, and what patients should know today uh, about COVID while we wait to see how many of them have been involved in telemedicine? Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate, but New York City was the ep one of the epicenters and you guys had like 430 some patients. We had over 2,000 patients and we were overflowing and had to open beds in the park next to the Mount Sinai Hospital in Central Park and we were seeing patients that way. So, I mean, understanding all this, initially when we didn't know what was happening, we said everybody that you know, transplants had to be delayed, clinical trials had to be on hold because we just didn't have the resources or the beds or the patients because all of us got deployed and we were taking care of COVID patients instead of actually being an oncologist. But I think looking back, we now, you know, we can say that there are certain risk factors which are very consistent for the myeloma patients as the rest of the a non-cancer patients and non-myeloma patients, so elderly, non-white race, and um, males particularly, and patients with cardiovascular risk factors, they're the ones at more risk. So we are, you know, I think you have to treat patients, like you said, with their myeloma. If they're newly diagnosed, they're progressing. I mean, you have to look at those risk factors, monitor them carefully. We can see them over telemedicine, stuff we can give them orally. We switch some of the IV chemo to oral. Now with DARA being sub-Q, you don't have as long time in the waiting room, so there's certain things you can do to limit too many people accumulating in the waiting room. But if you're in remission, if you are doing well, you know, if you skip a month here and there, 
not gonna break at all, right? You wanna be safe. So if you're really particularly high risk for these certain risk factors, we have to be cautious. That's extremely helpful, Deepu. Thanks for that. And 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 can I, uh, on the behalf of the three of us and the uh, you know four or five hundred people listening, thank you uh, for what you have done for your myeloma patients and for the community at large. Uh, absolutely, we can do a whole clap here. I mean, I know many of us have been on the front lines, um, and uh, it, it's just um, it's humbling uh, to see the the way despite all the challenges and the politics and whatever else, it's just humbling to see the, the medical community. I've never felt more sense of community per se within uh, within my hospital. I mean, now I know the ICU docs better than I've ever known them. And, you know, the I ID docs, uh, you know, I have colleagues wearing Tony Fauci shirts and, and whatever else it might be, but but it's uh, that's really impressive. You know, Craig, before we wrap up this session, and maybe as a segue ultimately into our next session when we talk a little bit about diversity, one of the things that Deepu had mentioned is that, you know, tragically, we've seen this virus uh, more more vigorously affect uh, the non-white population. I know here, for example, in Arizona, we had tragically a number of our uh, patients coming from the Navajo um, community uh, but we've seen in the African-American community, similarly, um, for many reasons, this this tragedy being even a greater tragedy. I just wanted to, to have your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, um, um, there, I think it's, of course, a, a very complex issue. Um, so, you know, there are components that we know and there are a lot of components that we don't know, specifically really the, the differences in the immune system between people of ethnicity and, and African-Americans, which is why, you know, and that does stretch over even beyond COVID. Um, and with myeloma being a cancer of the immune system, we do see that there are differences in myeloma between people of ethnicity. And so, you know, and that's why it's so, so important for um, you know, for African Americans and people of all ethnicities to be involved in clinical trials, um, for us to be able to answer the question that you just asked me, you know, a bit uh, much much better. I mean, we can always, you know, we can point at um, um, to access to care and to um, um, and to you know social economic uh, status, um, which is a lot of the times what we kind of say oh it's just because of social economics and but it's much more complex than that it is much more complex than that and and that's why it's so important for uh for african americans and people of all ethnicities to be in clinical trials so we can understand these differences and so i can say you know that maybe our people of ethnicity may need to receive a different you know therapy for uh, for COVID prevention um, or or even myeloma therapy because of these differences in the immune system. Well, thanks thanks so much, Craig, for your insight because we'll be discussing that in just a minute after we take our stretch break. Uh, let's close off this session, and Beth, I, I think you can report back um, that that uh, your husband would be proud that 76% uh, of our crowd are involved in telemedicine. Uh, so the 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 uh, majority of them, I don't know if he's standing there next to you, uh, but uh, you can tell them that uh, that we have we have we have believers in the system, and and I do think it has been extremely helpful, especially as we believe the importance of getting expert opinion and of connecting with your healthcare team, especially at a time like this. We don't want people to be uh, more isolated than they are. So this is where we're going to take just under a minute. So wherever you are, and I'm going to do it too. I'm going to stand up. Uh, and, and stretch. Um, and so I'm going to turn off my camera for a second here as I stand up and stretch because we don't want anybody getting any kind of uh, deep vein thrombosis or any other challenge uh, to get up and move around. Um, so we'll give you that opportunity uh, for, for barely a minute to stand up and stretch. Um, and if you have to run quickly to the restroom or something, feel free to do so. We still have about 40 minutes left in our time together. Uh, which we will um, uh, fill with our uh, final two segments, and we're very excited to do that. So we'll be back in about 20 seconds uh, when people have had a chance to stretch a bit more. So don't go away.
Okay, we will slowly make our way back into the room here. And we're now going to uh, move into our session two, for which we have two parts as well. We'll commence with a further discussion around the issue of diversity. Um, and then um, I'm excited to have Susie and Robin join us to talk more about uh, caregiver support. Um, I, I wanted to start by saying in the concept of diversity that this is something that has been very important uh, in the myeloma community and particularly important to the IMF for 30 years since its existence. That diversity and inclusion is not uh, only about the African-American community, although this morning we'll be focusing a little bit more on that area, but we've come to appreciate even COVID has helped us understand that diseases affect different populations in different ways. And in myeloma, we see this. We're going to be talking, as I say, primarily about the African-American community, but we know that uh, myeloma is diagnosed in a younger age in the Hispanic population, that we see different complications and outcomes in uh, different ethnic backgrounds. And so there, as I think Craig said it nicely, this is a very complex topic. And I don't pretend that in 10 minutes we can absolutely cover it, but I think it's important to sensitize people to the issue, to have them understand some of the unique features that exist here, and really that we have an approach that recognizes that um, so that we can all, uh, as our mission is at the IMF, not only to seek a cure for myeloma to support patients through it, that we can treat all patients and help uh, ensure that every uh, patient has the best opportunity possible to control their disease and have a quality of life during it. I'm just going to start with what I call the 10 key facts. There are 10 very important facts that you may or may not know about myeloma in the African-American community. Number one, it is the most common hematological cancer in this community. MGUS in myeloma, and this may be the most important one right now that people don't always know, is twice as common in the African-American community than in the Caucasian population. So, so if our incidence of MGUS is somewhere around 5% of all adults, it's nearly 10% in the African-American community. We've seen great improvements. You know, Beth was sharing earlier, the old days of VAD to where we are now, great improvements in survival, but that same improvement has not been seen in the African-American community. As you see here, um, for every 1.3 years of life gained for whites, we've only seen 0.8 of that, or just over half of that same benefit seen in the African-American population, which is, uh, of course, very sad. African Americans are younger at age of diagnosis and significantly so, somewhere around five year difference, uh, depending on where you look and what studies and databases, you know, whereas the average age of diagnosis in myeloma is the late 60s, it's more like the mid 60s for the African American population. Uh, fifthly, there's a longer time to a diagnosis once symptoms have been had, and we have seen this and, and had this repeated uh, several times where we have recognize that there is often a time lag, uh, unfortunately, between um, uh, the onset of symptoms and the, uh, the, um, um, uh, the, the true diagnosis being made. And we can talk about some of the challenges of that. Uh, sixthly, African-Americans are less likely to receive triplet therapies. And we've been discussing today already how important those are. Also less likely to receive stem cell transplants. And thirdly, less likely to participate in clinical trials. And Craig, you've already mentioned this already, and we'll come back to you in a moment, that you know, myeloma, uh, African-Americans represent somewhere between 18 to 20% of all myeloma patients in this country, but uh, about a quarter or a third maximum uh, of those on clinical trials, so maybe five to 6% of those in clinical trials, a third of that. There are biological differences that we're coming to appreciate a little bit more uh, about the myeloma in African-American populations. It may actually lead to more lower risk disease, more prevalence of translocation 1114, for example. And we do know from recent and large studies that when African-Americans receive equal mm -hmm. access to care, that their outcomes can be similar, if not even uh, better than those of whites. So that doesn't cover the whole gamut, Craig. Craig, I know you and I do a lot of talks on this and, and I've worked together and I've appreciated your partnership and friendship in this, but, but I've, I've tried to distill it down to those top 10. And so, one of our initiatives has been through our nurse leadership board and i'll mention our overall initiative in just a moment but you know is really finding ways to optimize the care of african-americans with myeloma in the whole of the medical community medicine as well as uh, within nursing uh, and beth of course this is under your leadership as well 
that we need to recognize those delays, that we have to help in expediting those diagnostic tests. We did a survey at the IMF, for example, and found that African Americans, when compared to, to, to Caucasians, really had difficulty getting bone marrow testing done to confirm their myeloma. And it wasn't just an insurance issue. There were lots of issues. There was the expediency of, of the process, the, the desire of the, the clinician to do so, lots of reasons. We need to understand patient perceptions about these things, in particular participation in clinical trials. And Craig, I know you mentioned this, so I'll come back to you in a moment about it, that there is a, a lack of trust in our clinical trial platforms in the country in many places for good reason. And so we need to recognize that so we can help overcome it and, and uh, uh, you know, push us all to better care. And so this is going to take trust. It is going to take engagement. It's going to take a team of individuals um, uh, and of course, our own cultural competence to recognize, uh, mm -hmm. and this is a, obviously a sensitive but such important topic in the day in which we live, to recognize the differences and to recognize inherent bias, unconscious bias, and sometimes conscious bias that uh, affects the way we care uh, for our patients. I'm delighted that one of the leaders in, in our field in nursing, Amy Pierre, was just able to recently publish with Tiffany Williams this great paper, obviously, I, I've just given you the, the picture of it. You'll have to look it up yourself and we can make it available if people wish, trying to drill down into these concepts much deeper to care, uh, to provide care in, in the nursing context and in our clinics about how very specific things we can do uh, to try and enhance the care of patients. Uh, and part of it, of course, is our old, overall <coughs> IMF uh, African American initiative that we've been working very hard on and are in the process of fully launching where we're going to be working, engaging the African-American community to increase awareness. Education to both the primary care world for earlier and more accurate diagnosis and also the hemon community to understand these sensitivities, to increase support to patients and their families, and indeed to support the kind of research that's needed uh, to better uh, face this. So turning to our panel, you know, what has been your experience in this area and what can we do to help overcome this disparity? Craig, I'll, I'll turn to you first because I know you could answer this in, in about two hours, <laughs> uh, but, but, but you know, giving us some high-level thoughts of how you would approach this would be really helpful to us. Yeah, you know, um, first, um, you know, thank you uh, for including this as, as um, in the agenda. Um, you know, it, it has been, you know, a, 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 a true passion of all of ours um, to, to really get um, a behind um, ethnicity and myeloma, because you know one thing that I, I tell all my patients is that understanding the differences between the ethnicities and myeloma and for African Americans uh, will help bring um, a cure to myeloma for all. Um, to understand that biology um, of of why is the incidence for African Americans, 11.6 per 100,000, as compared to whites of 5.2 um, 5 per 100,000, and why for Asians is it 3.2 per 100,000? We've looked and looked and looked to understand what those differences in the, in the incidence, it, it's something that's biologic. And understanding that biology is going to lead to an understanding of myeloma and benefits for all. Um, so, um, you know, with um, one thing that I think has come up, especially in the COVID era regarding um, African Americans and myeloma, is that one, one, not only is the biology a bit different, but also the, um, uh, the trust issues between um, African Americans and and their physicians and in the delivery of care of myeloma and like I'd mentioned um, in a focus group that we did with African American myeloma patients we actually found that during COVID that there's actually more distrust um, of patients towards their physicians because medicine has been so politicized recently and clinical trials have been so politicized that people are are, are wary of going on clinical trials. And, and that was surprising to me because thank goodness, myeloma clinical trials have not been at all politicized. 
And so, you know, there are lots of layers to this. And I think that probably one of the important layers to peel back is patient empowerment and patient education. Um, and especially for myeloma patients. Just like you had mentioned, cultural competence and understanding that not only is this disease different uh, between the ethnicities, but also their approach and being culturally competent to under to talk to patients of different cultural backgrounds differently um, in order to, um, to re re have them relate to you, you relate to them much better so we can, they'll trust, you know, we'll have shared decision making, we'll have trust between the physician and the, and the patient. And so that we can work together to, to be involved in trials and to ultimately cure the disease. Well, thanks, Craig. That's uh, very, very insightful. And that, that's one of the things that I'm so grateful with the work at the IMF, uh, <laughs> that we've tried to do that multi-pronged approach in, in educating the medical community, but also the patient community, and, and in, in doing so, engaging the African American community. One question has just come in saying, you know, what is being done to educate the, the primary care world? And this is indeed part of our initiative, that we're now going to be going to multiple cities across the country where there is a greater proportion of African-American patients and primary care physicians to educate them about the accurate and early diagnosis of myeloma. Um, the, very often, a lot of other conditions are, are thought of before myeloma, like diabetes, for example, and so myeloma can sometimes be forgotten. Um, Adipu, I mean, we know, of course, you work in a city um, uh, one of the city that never sleeps in one way, but but an incredibly diverse city. And I just wonder if you have some thoughts about this before we come to wrap up this session and pass it on to Robin and, and Susie. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things in New York City with the African American population or even Hispanic population is that they are working more than one job and sometimes they're working two jobs. So it's really hard for them to be on the treatment that they should because I have a patient who comes in he works at night and he basically comes to infusion clinic and as he's getting his treatment, he sleeps and then he goes to another job and another job, you know? So I think a lot of it is also they're supporting their family and then there are a lot that they're doing for their loved ones. And so you don't really put yourself first, you know, you want to take care of your family. So I think that's a lot of the reasons we see that here as well. Hmm. Beth, final thoughts from you. I know that you have the privilege of leading that nurse leadership board where you know, Amy and others have done such great work. Uh, I, I just so appreciate the multi-dimensional team that we have addressing this issue. Not that by any means we've solved it, but we're, we're starting, I think, to make progress. So I want to thank you for your leadership in this. But thoughts from you? Um, it, in um, 30 seconds or less, <laughs> I will say that um, it, in the 20 or so years I've been um, working with myeloma patients, I've recognize an unconscious bias um, exists, um, thinking maybe we shouldn't offer this clinical trial for the reasons that Dr. Maduri had mentioned. Um, I think we as clinicians need to establish trust and be clear why we're recommending one therapy versus the other. We know that translocation 1114, Venetoclax is great, and a lot of African Americans have T1114. So letting them know why we're recommending it, establishing trust, and really listening to their concerns, um, and letting them have the therapy that they find is right for them. I think we can overcome this, and um, we need to do better as clinicians. I appreciate what you're saying, Beth. Uh, you, know, um, you, were, you and I were formerly associate editors together, and I know you moved on to be an editor of a different journal, but I'm writing my editorial this week on uh, my father's advice at med school. And uh, when I entered med school, he gave me two pieces of advice. One was treat nurses like the professionals they are. And number two, he said, you were made with two ears and one mouth for a reason, um, the importance of listening. And, and I think that there has not been appropriate listening from many of these communities. And if there's any take home message I'd like to give people is being able to listen in an attentive way. You know that time, you know that way someone listens to you and they're kind of looking through the back of your head because they're not listening. We, we don't want to do that. We want to listen and we want to listen genuinely. Well, there are other resources, of course, that people can look up on the website, but I don't want to delay any further because I'm wanting to listen uh, to Robin and Susie who are now going to uh, present the next part and the final section of um, our um, uh, uh, seminar today uh, and I'm yielding over the control back to Amira so hopefully Robin you've got control of it now 
uh, to be able to move forward. And again, uh, I introduced you and Susie from the start. You're two of my heroes in life. I love you both. And I'm so thankful for the work that you do. And I'll turn it over to you. Um, and then I'll just come in at the end to, uh, to help close us off. So hopefully, Susie, Robin, oh, you've got control. Well, all right. I'm just seeing how I could get this. Uh, say, Amira, do I hit not yet or show my screen? Probably should be showing. Want... You can show your screen. Okay, and is, but my screen is not is not the slides. Oh, that's okay. You're close to it. If you go down and click on your slides in the bottom right, where you have them, um, you'll be able. There you go. Yeah. Magic. Okay. Okay. All right. And Thank let you, me. Robin, the floor is yours. Yay. Great. The magic of <laughs> technology. So, Susie, you want to start us off? Well, I want to say that um, it's been very interesting these past few months. Um, not going to the office and, you know, everybody working from home. So, it's really, really nice to see so many familiar faces and to feel like we're all together again. So even though um, we've been dealing with all kinds of things that just never, ever entered our minds, I think that it's really amazing how our team and all the patients and caregivers, how resilient that they have been and how brave that they have been, you know, going through all this. So I think that they're heroes and they're warriors and they're, you know, they're just an amazing group of people. So I just wanted to thank I and I hope all of you are hearing this because I am very, very proud of proud of you. Um, but the International Myeloma Foundation, I can't believe it, is 30 years old. I mean, how did that happen? I think I, I think I was, you know, I was 12 then, and now here we are. But the thing that makes the IMF so different is that we are truly global. We are one myeloma nation. We reach out and help people no matter where they live, no matter what language they speak, no matter what they eat for dinner. We are all one myeloma nation, and that's very, very important because working together, we can and we will finally find a cure for this disease because it's all about me not having to go to work. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, Robin, you want to jump in now? Sure. So thanks so much, Susie. And thank you to Dr. Joe and, and all of the panelists on, on here to include caregiving. And, and it's such an important aspect when a loved one is diagnosed, it, it becomes a, a team effort. And so when Michael, my husband, was diagnosed 20 years ago, it was very interesting to hear some of the conversation today about bad and what the options were way back then compared to the uh, multiple options we have available today. And so I think part of the challenges for caregivers is to also learn about all these good options. What makes sense for your loved one's life? What is that quality of life and the goals of life that you as, as a team together uh, want to see happen, and then to communicate those goals to your doctors so they can also help you understand which would be the best combinations and when. So it's so important that we have this team together and we talk about it. So talking about teams, this is a beautiful photo from last year's Support Group Leaders Summit. And you can see that these, this is a group of patients and caregivers that have stepped up to lead a local group. And quite interestingly enough, 90% of the myeloma support groups are led by patients and caregivers. And the rest are led by wonderful nurses and social workers who are helping us. And so I want to just share with you that last week, the IMF had a meeting uh, with our Global Myeloma Action Network. And I bring this up because I feel it's important that today support groups are growing all over the world and patients and caregivers work together to help, help overcome 
these barriers and, and to network together and to learn and support each other. Because truly, my Loma has no borders. And that's what we're all in this together to do well. In the United States, there are about 160 myeloma specific support groups uh, that are meeting together. And on the IMF's website, myeloma.org, we've got an interactive map and you can see where all the groups are. And we also have websites available for each of these groups. And people can click on them to find out where is their local group. And if there is not a group near you, today we're fortunate, one of those silver linings of COVID, if there are any, uh, are that all of the support groups, right, Susie? I mean, you know, silver linings and COVID, not so sure, but silver linings and support groups uh, are, are a wonderful thing because now all the groups are meeting virtually by the same technology that we are using today. And so the groups are meeting, they're sharing, they're learning, they're having wonderful speakers present. So if there is not a group near you today, you can literally attend a group anywhere you want virtually. Yep. So I encourage yep. you to do that. Susie? I, I completely agree. I mean, we're, we're all across the country. And the most important thing is that no matter what what's happening, Globally, we still need to be able to reach out to all these people, the, the caregivers, the patients. They're, you know, they. It's all about them, and we need to just, you know, keep them uplifted. There is, you know, that I can just see that that cure is just right. It's just right around the corner. It's just this close. And uh, so, for anybody out there who, you know, his heart's beating a little bit, you know, kind of fast, and because they're new to this, just remember, we are one myeloma nation and we stick together and if you need anything at all don't hesitate to pick up the phone or send an email to any one of us um, except for Joe <laughs> love you too Susie uh, that's that's funny so so we're going to talk a little bit now about the local support groups and what are they doing to support their myeloma caregivers so they encourage the caregivers to engage in the local myeloma support group meetings. And I, this sounds silly, but I say it because when I go to a support group meeting anywhere across the country, it's the same. You'll go around the table and the patient will talk. And then if they have a caregiver sitting next to them, the caregiver will typically say, oh, I'm good. He already said everything. But we want to engage those caregivers. We want to hear their story. What are their challenges? What are their tips? So getting them to participate. And then locally, offer connections between the caregivers outside of a support group meeting. So become friends, bond with them. Offer to go for a walk, go get a cup of coffee. Just talk and learn for, and support each other. And then there are some really good local forums for caregivers so that they can share their tips and challenges and successes, whether that's on Facebook or smart patients, it's important for caregivers to continue to reach out to each other. And then provide what are those local resources specifically for the caregivers to, to use. And, and so everywhere, no matter where you live in the, in the country, there are churches that have support groups. There are lots of organizations that reach out to support groups. And if you're going through a stem cell transplant, I know a lot of uh, patients and caregivers use something called Caring Bridge so they can communicate through each other. So look for these types of resources. And then something that's near and dear to Susie and I, last year at the Support Group Leaders Summit, we created a visual exploration of not only patient resilience, but caregiver resilience. So I'm gonna show you, this is Sue Dunnett, who has been working with the IMF for many, many years. She lives in Scotland. And through a number of interviews, she realized that in the myeloma world, it's very interesting, as I said before, that most patients and caregivers um, step out outside of their own myeloma and become engaged in their local support communities. And so we had this program 
called resilience last year, and we're going to continue on with it because now more than ever, we need to learn how to nurture our resilience. We need to find, dig down deep when we're having those rough days, what is it that brings us back to feeling strong and good again? And these are some pictures of support um, patients and caregivers showing their resilience, what brings them back to these photos. And Susie, th this just is so powerful. And I know that it meant a lot to all of the support group leaders at the summit. So I hope that people here think about this a little bit and, and what brings you this strength. One thing that I really uh, hope that people find find it to, okay to do is to cry. We have so much stress and so much going on and, you know, to keep that all bottled up. So I tell people, listen, you know, if you, if you, you can't, you can't get, you know, otherwise you're just going to explode. But, you know, if you need to cry, go ahead, punch the pillow, cry, 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 five, 10 minutes. That's it. Get up and keep going. But just to let off that anxiety, it's, it's amazing. It really does help. It works. I've done it. So, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, yep. I'm not afraid to say there are days we all cry. It happens. So mm -hmm. support again for the caregivers. So within the support groups, sometimes the groups have a special support group meeting that's just for the caregivers. Other times they have where both patients and caregivers are together and they're meeting and sharing so they can all understand together what are those challenges. One of the things that we've also done is we've asked our caregivers to share in, in a um, PowerPoint presentation what I wish I'd known when my loved one was first diagnosed. And there are fantastic tips in there from caregivers for caregivers. And if you attend a support group, your leaders have access to that PowerPoint. So I wanted to mention that. And then if you would like any of the support group directors to lead a meeting specifically uh, focused on caregivers, please contact us. We can certainly do that for you. I think earlier today, Dr. Joe did talk a little bit about the importance of telemedicine. And from a caregiver's perspective, I can, I can share that it's a little challenging now during COVID. While telemedicine is really important, and there are a lot of good things about telemedicine, it's challenging because as a caregiver, I cannot go into the office with Michael anymore, and I cannot ask the questions that I think are important, or ask the questions that maybe Michael is not asking. For example, Dr. Joe, we all know that sometimes patients don't always uh, be honest about how much pain are they having? And so if, if your loved one is not really being honest about that, it's important for you as a caregiver to be on that phone call and to say to the doctor, hey, he may be saying, you know, yes, everything is good, but here's what's happening at home. And we also know that when we are on our drive home, back when we used to uh, have our in-appointment um, <laughs> visits, uh, on the drive home, I would hear one thing and then I would say, well, no, this is what I heard. So it's really, really important to have everyone listening, sharing, and learning on these telemedicine appointments. The other thing I'll share here, it's the perfect opportunity to do that second opinion, especially if you're going through uh, relapse and you may need to change your, your treatment plan, uh, increase something, uh, decrease something, or altogether change your regimen. And now to have the opportunity when your most insurance companies are paying for these telemedicine appointments, I think it's fantastic to reach out to myeloma experts uh, and, and get that appointment. And if you want to have a list of who those doctors may be available for telemedicine second opinion appointments, you can call the IMF info line and they can help you get that set up. So, Susie, what do you I, I think? I have something that, well, I have a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, first of all, um, I remember that there was this man who went into his doctor's 
office and uh, he wanted to, you know, get some information from the doctor. And the doctor was really rude to him. And he said, well, if you want, if you want to make, you know, make, have me, you know, make up a, a, you know, a prescription for you, you, know, you, you just can't just barge in here. You have to make an appointment. And the man said, I did. And it's today. And so <laughs> Luckily, this poor man did not just like run out of there, and I don't think he kept that doctor as his doctor. But I think you have to be—you have to be. There's so much going on in your life, and especially dealing with myeloma, um, you just can't be afraid to just speak your mind, speak up, let let yourself be heard, and it, it's so important. The doc, I'm looking at my. My husband is a doctor. The doctors are not God. <laughs> They're wonderful doctors, but you know, if you don't if you don't have the doctor that you feel is right for you, don't be afraid to change doctors. Absolutely. And then having your main myeloma specialist work with your local doctor, that's so important too, because obviously if you get hospitalized, if your temperature spikes or something's going on and you go to the ER, your local doctor is key, but having your guidance come from the myeloma experts that are doing the clinical trials and having the most myeloma patients in their practice, that's a comfort zone for me as a caregiver. So some of the things that we had talked about earlier, I heard Dr. Doe and, and Dr. Dury quite often talking about the physical distancing, but still remaining social. It's so important today with COVID-19 and we're all taking these precautions, but how do we continue to be um, socially engaged? So Nellie Ello, who is a wonderful caregiver for over 25 years, she has Zoom visits once a week with her children and grandchildren. She picks out a favorite recipe. These were some nice velvet cupcakes and they just bake together. And I'm sure there's a lot of laughing and taste testing going on. And so we're going to talk a little bit about creative ways to stay physically distant, um, but still social. And Dr. Dury quite often has talked about who is in your bubble. And your bubble are the people that are practicing social distancing and physical distancing similarly to you. So they're comfortable, they're safe, and, and know who is in your bubble. This next slide is a dear friend and, and a patient, Sherry, who lives out in Idaho. And she sent me this picture and this is her family and her family is in her bubble. And they go out and they take nice walks and hikes together. But you can see they also have their masks ready. So if they come across anyone on the trail, they're able to still stay safe. Another way that we can physically distance and be social, this is my backyard and we like to watch movies together. So I'll have the, our adult children come over and everybody will put a blanket out and we'll watch a funny movie together and enjoy the fresh outdoors. And obviously our dogs love it too. <laughs> I'm coming over Robin for the next one. All right, I'm, I'm ready. You pick the movie out. <laughs> All right, and so we have talked about all of the safety precautions of washing your hands and staying six feet away and, and coughing into your elbow and don't touch your face and all these important things, but the anxiety specifically for caregivers, because typically we're the ones going out and doing the groceries and the errands, so we have to take these extra cautions and have that Purell in your pocket and in the car and Maybe, you know, as soon as you walk in the door, when you come home to wash up again. But most importantly here, when we're going out and doing these errands, please, please, please remember to take good care of yourself as well. I, I know that it's a real challenge now. So Susie, you're so good at being an effective caregiver for many, many years. Do you want to talk a little bit on this slide? Sure. Um, don't The thing, that popped up right right in the front is don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, a lot of people are afraid to talk to their doctor or to let someone else know that they have myeloma. Um, they don't want the neighbors to know. They don't want, you know, it, it's very, very scary. Melanoma? No, no, no. Myeloma. What the heck is that? So it's very important that we continue to to reach out 
to all the support groups and the, the nurses and patients and doctors to make sure that, that they feel the power to question, to ask if this is the right treatment for me. Um, it's also very important that if you're not getting along with this doctor, fire him or her. <laughs> you know, you don't like your doctor? Get another doctor. There's lots of them out there. <laughs> Craig's going like this. <laughs> um, that's that's very very important. So, I was going to say what what that reminds me of is this little graphic over on the right hand side. For me, I had challenges in delegating and or asking for help, and and so I put this chart up here just to think about it because you don't have to do everything all the time. People want to help you. I know people would say, what can we do to help? And, and most caregivers say, oh, nothing, we're fine. Let them know this makes other people feel good to help you. People want to help. And so we have to let our guard down and accept that help sometimes. And, and so Susie, you always, right? It, it's not easy to do, but I think we just need to, someone once told yeah. me, Robin, you know what? you're not being fair to me because you're not allowing me to help you. So then I thought about it in a different way and I thought, okay, well, if these, these people want to really help, then let's let that happen. So again, yeah. my loma, my loma is not a heart attack. Most of the time you have time to breathe, to learn, to talk, to share, and, and to join a support group and just one day one step at a time i remember days that by three o'clock in the afternoon i would just be that's it i feel like i have to shut down but if you take it one step at a time you can get through it so you need to take care of yourself physically mentally and spiritually this is my backyard and all three of those things in my garden that's that's what keeps me i want going. that backyard <laughs> I love your backyard as well. California is a beautiful place. But this is Connecticut, and it is pretty beautiful here right now. And so we all have to take a break, and we all have to do what we can to relieve stress. And this video on the left-hand side is our colleague, Kelly Sidorowitz, and she created this video, and it's a very gentle yoga of stretching. And if you do this, take some time for you, patients and caregivers, take the time to do the stretch and, and feel better. We all need to do that and give ourselves a break. This picture just makes me happy because this is a very dear friend of ours, Thomas, who had a little bit of a rough year. And for his birthday in August, he received some great news. And this is him looking good, feeling good. And when I look at that, this is what it's all about. When our loved one is doing well, then as caregivers, then we feel good too. Life is good. So you're not alone. Allow that person with myeloma to do what they can by themselves. Pay attention to your own health and medical needs. Seek the support through families and friends and of course your local support groups and participate in those healthy activities and regular exercise. And please get your proper rest and, and diet, eat well, and then be proud of who you are as a caregiver. And you know, you do make a big difference in the life of your loved one. And sometimes you just need to give yourself a good hug at the end of the day. So Susie and I are always here for you. And thank you to everyone for including caregivers in this session. We're very grateful. And now I'll turn it back over to the good doctors. Well, thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Robin and Susie. Uh, it, it's hard. Uh, it's hard to say much more after that. Um, uh, you, you guys are absolutely wonderful on so many fronts. We're so grateful for the work that you do. Uh, it, it's, it's humbling to be able to have you as friends and colleagues. Uh, so I'm very, very thankful for what you've shared. As I know many of our patients here today will really benefit uh, from that kind of discussion and that kind of openness and honest uh, approach. And so very, very thankful for you being with us today. 
Um, our time has gone very quickly, uh, so I just want to conclude uh, by first of all thanking our sponsors, as you see here, for uh, their support and being able to make uh, an event like this possible. And so we're thankful for all of you. Uh, and I'm particularly thankful for this just really amazing stellar crowd of individuals, Susie and, and, and Robin, for the experience and the um, uh, the work that you have done in this for so many years and be able to present it to us. And of course, uh, to Beth, to Deepu, to Craig, uh, thank you for your commitment every day to myeloma patients. I trust that everybody who's joined, everybody who's joined us today has had um, a, a real enjoyment of this activity, that it's given you uh, both some insight into the disease, but also into your heart to support you through this journey that we're all on together. We've tried to answer all the questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to every last one of them, but as was mentioned, you can always reach out to the info line uh, and we can try and answer all of your questions through that means. So I'm going to thank Amira and Miko and the whole team at the IMF who put this all together and I'm going to wish each of you a wonderful rest of day. We look forward to seeing you. Please keep in touch with our website and with our uh, various programs that are coming out so that we can continue to give you new updates in this disease. Thanks everybody again and have a Thanks great day. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.